Sydney Hobart Yacht Race, one of the world's greatest, toughest, and most enduring ocean races. For many, it is the Everest of sailing. In this, the 58th year of the race, 57 yachts hope to conquer the danger and rugged beauty of the 630 nautical mile course. It's the passion of yacht racing, the excitement of leaving Sydney, arriving in Hobart, the camaraderie with your own crew members, the listing on the skeds and seeing where you are. It's a fascinating race. You hardly, you hardly dare go to sleep for two days because it's that exciting. It might sound strange to the man in the street, but it is that exciting. There can be few better starting points to a race than Sydney's impressive harbour. Each year, hundreds of thousands of spectators gather on the harbour's edge and millions watch on television. It's a big event on any calendar. The spectacle begins at the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia in Rushcutters Bay. The CYCA has organised and officiated the race since it began in 1945. Over the years, the Blue Water Classic has come to represent the ultimate in seamanship. Stories of courage are passed down the generations, lending a sense of history and pride to every sailor who dares to compete. The overall Victor's Trophy, the Tattersall's Cup, is awarded each year to the winner of IMS Handicap Honours, under which boat, crew and sail size are calculated to level the playing field between yachts of all different shapes and sizes. For the Commodore of the CYCA, it's the spectators' support that makes so many sailors come back each year. I think it is addictive. Um, at times, once, you, once you've left Sydney Harbour and, and you leave all the crowds behind, uh, you start to think, what am I doing out here? Uh, especially if the weather turns really nasty. You get into the Derwent and suddenly the crowds reappear and, and they're cheering and giving you a fantastic welcome. And, and that tends to dull the memories of what's gone on for the days before when you're talking about next year's race. In 1947, John Bonetto sailed in his first Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race. This year, we'll see the Tasmanian compete in his 42nd. It's constant in its challenge, but it's always different in its challenge because you won't get any two days where it's the same. It may be calm lots of times, but there'll be a different current or a distant sea temperature or the weather about to, to be a bit different and uh, you're denuding yourself if you go out and say it's going to be the same as it was yesterday. It's never the same as it was yesterday. 
The yachts pass six degrees of latitude, leaving Sydney Harbour before sailing out to the Tasman Sea. The fleet then hoped to safely navigate Bass Strait. At Tasman Island, they turn into Storm Bay and up the Derwent River to Hobart. In today's technological age, the top maxi yachts hope to complete the course in two days or less. This year sees two of the most impressive maxis ever to compete in the race go head to head. Alfa Romeo, owned by New Zealander Neville Crichton, undefeated in over 20 races, it's arguably the fastest ocean racer in the world. And Cannon, owned by England's Mike Slade, at 97 feet in length, it's seven feet longer than Alfa Romeo, but their rivalry is much tighter. We analyze each other. We will have an idea where they're weak and where they're strong. It doesn't affect you when you're out there because the wind comes from where the wind comes and the sea state is the sea state. And you are trying to get down there. The skippers talk to each other, so I know exactly what their rating is, I know exactly what their weight is, I know the, the length of their core, the shape of their fin, and what their rudder is. So we, we all know, and they know all about us. So they know where we're strong and where we're weak. It's interesting. It doesn't affect it. When you're out there, you're out there. It'll be what it'll be. The top yachts naturally attract the top crews, eager to add the race to their resumes. Slade has called for England's Neil MacDonald, who won line honors here last year aboard Asa Abloy. For him, competing in this race is as tough as they come. I think it's more man management, trying to use the resources that you've got to the, the best ability that you can. Um, there's an awful lot of um, aspects to a, a race like this, and trying to keep it all together is a, is a, is a difficult task. You can't be a mate all the time. Um, you, the decisions that you make will not please everybody, and that, that's a fact of life. You know, you go into a sail change, which is going to be hard work for a long period of time. People are going to get wet, they're going to get tired. Um, and you've got to try and explain why that particular manoeuvre is worth doing. So it, it, it is a difficult balance of being um, kind to people, but also trying to get the best out of, of, of the boat and the whole race. Boxing Day morning, and Sydney Harbour awaits the fleet's arrival from Rushcutters Bay. And I'd like to welcome you all, ladies and gentlemen, to the race briefing the Rolex Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race, the 58th year that the race has been on. It's standing room only inside the CYCA as owners, skippers and crew listen intently to the weather briefing. Five to ten knot winds are forecast at the start, with only slightly stronger winds some distance out to sea. Conditions seem benign for the moment. All I can do uh, now at this stage is to wish you good luck. I hope you have a very successful race. We've just had a weather briefing now which suggests it's not going to be the challenge that it normally is, but uh, even with that weather forecast, you don't really know what to expect. Bass Straits is a, is a wild part of the world. I've done several round-the-world races, and I still haven't seen the conditions that I've encountered in Bass Straits. It is a wild, wild place. The overall forecast seems to favour Crichton's out-and-out -out racer, Alfa Romeo. McDonald and Slade aboard Cannon will be hoping for stronger winds so as to take advantage of its longer waterline length. The rest of the fleet go through last-minute preparations. One mistake here could be the difference between the Tattersall's Cup and your dreams in tatters. Bob Steele's quest is one of the favourites, as is Ichiban, whose sailing master is twice champion Roger Hickman. The camaraderie before the race is friendly. It's you know, a little bit of an anticipation. On the water, it's just go for the jugular stuff. It's to die for. It's, uh, it's no different than in the, in the fighting ring or the soccer field or Olympic going for gold. It's just full on everything to beat your competitors. One man who is all too aware of the type of challenge ahead of these sailors is Sir Edmund Hillary. 
it's almost 50 years since he conquered Mount Everest, and fittingly, the New Zealander has the honour of officially starting the race. Well, I certainly think that uh, if they strike wild ocean conditions, uh, which make it life pretty tough for them, it's very similar uh, to being at uh, 8,000 uh, metres or higher on Mount Everest. Not only are they uh, meeting a tremendous challenge, uh, but possibly uh, they are risking life itself. And uh, I have a great admiration for that. As the yachts jockey for position in Sydney Harbour ahead of the start, the weather suddenly worsens, contradicting the light spinnaker start that had been forecast. The tension is mounting aboard cannon. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty high pressure part of the race for us, especially in a big boat which is not very manoeuvrable. The first hour or so will be pretty hard work to get out of the heads in good shape. One p.m. and Sir Edmund Hillary fires the cannon that sends the 57 yachts out of Sydney Harbour. Alfa Romeo and Cannon are neck and neck. Behind them, a collision sees the retirement of Valeroux and following the race, the disqualification of Peugeot Racing. In the chasing pack, Nicorette, Australian Scambia Wild Thing and Grundig are all on the tail of Cannon and Alfa Romeo, and Mike Slade knows it. Powered by a freshening nor'easter, Alfa Romeo averages 15 knots out to Sydney Heads, leading Cannon by 30 seconds at the first rounding mark. The race record of one day, 19 hours and 48 minutes, set by the Danish entry Nokia in 1999, is on. At the very back of the fleet is the FAR 52 Ichiban, owned by Matt Allen. Sail problems have meant they are already 40 minutes behind the leaders. But Allen is resilient. We have a very strong ethic in our crew that it, it's, it's not only important to get to the start line, but it's very important to get to the finish line as well. It is a race not only to win, but it's also a, a test of seamanship in many respects. And, and that's the beauty of the race. A week ago, Alan's yacht snapped a rudder during training exercises. A new rudder didn't arrive from Malaysia until late Christmas Day leaving the crew less than 24 hours to make Ichiban seaworthy again. For Hickman, it's all part and parcel of the race. Doing the Rolex Sydney to Hobart yacht race is not just about starting on Boxing Day, it's about preparing your boats, overcoming obstacles. All through the race, it'll be unfavourable. So you've got to step up to the plate and, and achieve things. And so we've had a great experience over the last three days. We're doing what people said we couldn't do. Australian DIY seems to have worked as Ichiban jumps from last to 12th. Overall honours could still be within Allen's and Hickman's grasp. At the head of the fleet, Alfa Romeo has stretched its lead over Cannon to three miles along the New South Wales coastline. But Cannon's owner, Mike Slade, remains optimistic. Well, we had a good start, and uh, as you can see now, the wind is a uh, good strong breeze, quite a strong sea swell, and it suits us, this, and we're in a very nice position. We've got inside of them, we're both above track, so the course to uh, Hobart is 188 and we're doing about 170, so we're all east of the rum line, as we call it, which is where we both want to be. There's a current 
beginning to flatten out the sea a little bit now. We're hoping for more breeze as we go into the evening. We've got number four up, which is quite safe. We're very nicely comfortable sailing here. And uh, I'm very happy. I mean, we're absolutely right in this fight. Seven miles behind Cannon is Australian Scandia Wild Thing, followed by last year's runner-up Nicorette and the race's big surprise, 66-foot super skiff Grundig. The competition for overall honours and the Tattersall's Cup is just as close. George Snow's Brinda Bella heads the IMS division with Andrew Short Marine Mercury in second place and veteran Sid Fisher's Ragamuffin third. The city of Hobart. For 51 weeks of the year, it's the quiet capital of Tasmania. But for seven days over the new year, the city transforms itself into a bustling international port for the yachts of the Rolex Sydney Hobart. It's the thought of this welcome that spurs many a sailor on during the race's more treacherous moments. And they usually come during the Bass Strait crossing, but not this year. In unusually calm conditions, Alfa Romeo has stretched its lead to five miles. It looks plain sailing from here, but everything could still change in an instant. Bass Strait is only 150 miles wide, but two wave patterns converge here, often causing devastating results. In 1998, six lives were tragically lost when the race was hit by a terrible storm. The disaster's aftermath saw the CYCA raise the standard of yachts entering the race. Communications, yacht construction, rigging, stability, and most importantly, sea safety were also improved. At least half the crew on every yacht must now be trained in sea safety and survival. Shane Kearns, owner and skipper of race entrant Komatsu San Marlo, teaches one such course in Sydney. This thing here is not the helicopter lifting strop. Right, when the helicopter comes to get you. All that's the reason the, the, the course is so good is, is because it, it brings into play procedures for things that uh, go wrong. And normally on a race such as the, the Hobart, after two to three days, the guys are fairly fatigued, um, are cold, um, some have been seasick, uh, and the only thing that will overcome that is if they've got a, a set course of action to do in any emergency and they fall back on their training as opposed to panic, which is what most people do if they, if they just don't know what to do at the time. No Rolex Sydney Hobart fleet has ever been better prepared than this year's. Fortunately, no such safety procedures are necessary as the fleet sail calmly into their second night at sea. Ichiban, sail and rudder problems are but a distant memory. Glorious sailing conditions all night. Sunshine and a bit of warmth coming our way. Off, uh, off Sunders Island and uh, heading quickly for Tasmania. Beautiful sailing all night really. Um, kept a lot of pace on and uh, pulled quite a lot of time out of uh, a lot of our com competitors during the night, so it was, uh, it was a real smack against the carpet, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was a crackle. 
It hasn't been going so well for Mike Slade and Cannon. The previous day, they collided with a whale, causing damage to the hull. In this race, the elements aren't the only thing that can affect you. The competition for overall honours looks like coming down to three yachts. Quest, Zeus II and another challenge. At the head, Alfa Romeo has opened up an unassailable 20-mile lead on the fleet. Despite reaching speeds of up to 26 knots during the second half of the race, light winds mean the race record is out of reach. But line honors are theirs in a time of two days, four hours, and 58 minutes. For owner Neville Crichton, it's the culmination of two years of planning with the world's best yacht designers, builders, sailmakers, and manufacturers. I feel it fantastic for coming in here first, and uh, it was good. We didn't break any records, but we didn't break any damage on the boat either, so it was a good, good race. A remarkable finish sees Grundig come second, just 44 minutes behind Alfa Romeo. It flew past Cannon in Bass Strait and went on to match speeds reached by Alfa Romeo. For Cannon, the wind that was needed to take advantage of its greater size and bulk just never came. but there's still a warm welcome in Constitution Dock for its crew and owner, Mike Slade, as they finish third. It's being here and doing it, it's an important thing, and we've had a great time. Everyone's been very supportive. We love Sydney, everyone helped us a lot there, and we're gonna thoroughly enjoy Hobart too. Over the next day and a half, the remaining fleet all safely make it to Hobart. Ichiban comes home in 11th place. The last day coming down the Tasmanian coast was with very hard running conditions was some of the best sailing I've ever done. Um, surfing through waves, um, doing about 24, 25 knots boat speed was just sensational sailing. Barry Miller is last to arrive in a time of three days, 23 hours and 23 minutes. It's the fastest completion of a Rolex Sydney Hobart yacht race in history. Overall honours is a very close run and complicated thing, with at least a dozen yachts having stood a good chance of winning at some stage of the race. But it's the 46-foot yacht Quest and owner Bob Steele, who narrowly missed out winning in 1995, who collect the spoils of victory. The Tattersall's Cup and a smart new watch. Surreal, really. It's fantastic. I mean, it's like our little Everest. When Sir Edmund Hillary started the race, you look at a guy like that, an icon of the world, and he conquered Everest, and we've done our own little bit. But no, we had a wonderful race, and, uh, you know, we just had a little bit of luck in the Derwent. Last time in 95, it wasn't so much lucky. We lost by seven minutes. This year, we won by nearly seven minutes. So uh, the luck, the favour of the wind god was with us this year, which was sensational. 